Reach for your holster and get out your Bible this morning. Let's be quick on the draw. Raise them up high and make our declaration. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen. I think we've had church today. First John is a call by God to fellowship with God and to fellowship with one another. And it's really similar to the call that we read about in the Song of Solomon where we are told, Come away, my beloved. And the Song of Solomon illustrates the kind of relationship, the kind of closeness that Jesus desires to have with the Bride of Christ, that is, His church. And we've seen that 1 John can basically be divided up into three different sections. The first is the light of Jesus. The second is the love of Jesus. And the third is the life of Jesus. And in this morning's study, we return to the theme of light, where the Apostle John contrasts truth with lies, and the light with darkness. And so, with that brief introduction, would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. If you are new to church and you're not real familiar with the various books of the Bible, uh, the book of 1 John is in the New Testament. The very last book in the New Testament is Revelation. And right before Revelation is Jude, and right before for Jude is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John chapter 2, and we'll be looking at uh, verses 18 through 27. The Apostle John writes, children, and this is a, a term of affection. Again, he's a hundred years old, so everyone is a child in his eyes. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Verse 20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But the one who denies Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Verse 25. This is the promise which He Himself made to us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. 
As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, throughout this passage of Scripture that we just read, there are some very, very key words that should automatically draw your attention and that you should perhaps even highlight as we study through this passage. Some of the words that are very important are the words truth, true, lies, liar, deceive, denies, antichrist or antichrist, confesses and abides. All very vital and very important words for us to recognize and to understand. And John begins this new portion of scripture by addressing the key word antichrist. Notice he says that in verse 18, Children, in the last hour, many Antichrist will arise. And this phrase, last hour, it, it can be confusing, but basically it means this. It means in light of the scope of human history as things begin to wind down. And what John meant by that, what the Holy Spirit meant as he inspired him to write these words, whether that's a thousand years or a day, you know, uh, a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years to him is like a day. He lives in the eternal now. But he highlights this, this, these two words, last hour. And so what he's telling us here is that very dark, very deceptive, very dangerous things are going to occur in the last days. Towards the time of Jesus' return to earth, there will be a significant increase regarding the rise of that which is Antichrist. And the word antichrist or antichrist plural, it's a very interesting word. And actually the Apostle John is the only one who uses this word in the scripture. And it literally means this, antichrist, whether it's a capital A or a small a, it means this, against Christ or in the place of Christ. And so someone or something that is antichrist is against Christ, Jesus Christ, and wants or wants to take the place of Christ in our lives. And there's basically a threefold application here that would be good for all of us to know. The first application is that there is a person who is referred to as the Antichrist. Not a, but the Antichrist. And we read about the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13, chapter 16, and chapter 19, as well as other places in Scripture. They don't necessarily use that word, but their description of the people, person fits the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to be somebody who arises to the forefront of the earth's political and social and economic schemes of things in a time of great and dire need. And as they arise, they are going to capture the attention and the affection of the world, and they will have complete and total authority over the entire world. Daniel speaks 
of this person in Daniel chapter 11, if you're interested, interested in that. Paul refers to this person as the man of lawlessness, or the man of sin, and also the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so the Bible reveals that there is the Antichrist. Number two, Antichrist, small a, also speaks of various teachers who are Antichrist. They are false teachers. They are false prophets. They are false prophets and false teachers, listen, who deny, diminish, and delude who Jesus is and or they claim to be Christ themselves. And we've heard a, a, a lot of clowns throughout the ages uh, declare that they themselves are Christ coming again. And in 1 John, if you're still in your Bible, look with me in chapter 2, verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, notice small a, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And so they deny the person of Jesus Christ. They're false teachers, they're false prophets. And Jesus himself actually spoke about these type of people. Let's look here at Matthew 24, verses 23 and 24. This is Jesus speaking. Let's read this out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Wow. That's a stark warning, isn't it? That's a very sobering war, warning that the elect, if possible, could be deceived by false Christ and their lies. And so there is the Antichrist. There are various Antichrists who are teachers that are false teachers and false prophets. And then the third application is this, and that is there is a spirit of Antichrist, small a, a spirit of Antichrist. And let's look again in 1 John. Let's look at chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3. John says, Beloved, notice, this is, this is very, very important. It's very important that we have ears to hear what John is saying right now. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Notice, he doesn't say, do not believe every teacher every prophet, every man, every woman. He's talking, listen, he's talking about something behind the person that is motivating that person. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is, Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard that is, is coming and now it has already is it in the world? And so, each and every man has a spirit, but this is speaking of something much darker. 
and much deeper. This is speaking of a demonic spirit and or spirits that will be unleashed throughout the world for the purpose of deceiving people and specifically deceiving people in regard to Jesus Christ, his nature, his purpose, his call. And so it's very vital that we understand this because, listen, to deny that Jesus came in the flesh, which is another way of saying to deny that God became man, is to deny the deity of Christ. And we're going to talk more about this when we get to chapter 4. But it's even more than that. It's even deeper and widespread than that because it is a spirit at work in the world today. And it is a spirit that is against Christ and against the teachings of Christ and against the Christian faith. And this spirit, my friends, is running rampant in the world today. And it is my conviction that... At this very moment, this nation has come under the spell of the spirit of Antichrist. Guys, listen. When we have people in the highest places and levels of government come against two of the most sacred things in Scripture, and that is the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of life, children, and who say that Christians, listen, must, quote, must change our beliefs, unquote, to conform to their beliefs and to their stand regarding pro-abortion and pro-same-sex marriage, that is the spirit of Antichrist at work in our nation. Make no mistake about it. That comes from the pit of hell. It goes against Jesus. It goes against his teachings. And it seeks to take the place of Christ in our lives. And it, it seeks to usurp the teachings of Christ in our lives. We must change our beliefs to accommodate their false doctrine and their false beliefs. That's what we're being told, my friends. Let us have eyes to see. Let us have ears to hear. And many, many people today, even those in the body of Christ, I know some, I love them, but they are part partnering with this spirit of Antichrist, and even the elect are being deceived. And it breaks my heart. Loved ones, here's my exhortation, here's my plea. Do not be deceived by the spirit of Antichrist that is at work in the world and in our nation today. And John thankfully tells us how we can recognize or identify some of these false teachers, some of these counterfeit Christians who are against Christ or want to take the place of Christ. And so, how do we recognize counterfeit Christians? Number one, they depart from the fellowship. They depart from the fellowship. Notice what John says in verse 19. He says, they went out from us. Why? Because they were not really of us. Now, very important to understand that this is not talking about someone who leaves one Christian church and goes to another Christian church. And because they left, you know, God's anointed church, AFB, we're going to brand them with a 666 on their forehead. You know, we just put it on their forehand, not their forehead. <laughs> no, that, that's not what it's talking about. When that happens, you bless them. Especially the divisive ones. You really bless them and say, May the Lord be with you. 
No, this is referring to what we sang about this morning, the communion of the saints, the wider body of Christ throughout the world, the kingdom of God. And John says when they leave the universal church that their departure is merely evidence that they were never really born again. They were never really of us. Now, granted, they, they may have attended church. They, they, they may have had religion, but they never had a relationship or fellowship with Jesus Christ. And there's a big difference between having religion and having relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. But let me just say something about those who profess to know Jesus but are not involved in any church at all. They're not involved in a, a, a church fellowship. They're not even involved in a home fellowship. They're not involved with other believers. Anyone who departs from the church and thinks that they no longer need the church is going against Christ and against the teachings of Christ. They too have fallen prey to the spirit of Antichrist that wants to separate and divide the body of Christ. And many people fall under the spell of the spirit of Antichrist as they have allowed uh, offense or wounds or disappointments or whatever it might be to convince them that they no longer need to be involved and to be engaged with God's people. The, the, the just me and God attitude is against the teachings of of Christ. It's Antichrist. But again, John is speaking about and talking about those who don't leave one church and go to another, but he's primarily talking about those who depart from the universal body of Christ for a very specific reason. Number two, how do we recognize counterfeit Christians? Well, they also deny the faith. They don't only depart from the fellowship, they deny the faith. And we see John addressing this in verses 20 through 25. He says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know, I have written to you because you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one, here it is, who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. And so they deny the faith. Guys, listen, false teachers, false prophets are usually always self-appointed and self-anointed. They are self-appointed and they are self-anointed. And this too is the spirit of Antichrist. But John says, hey guys, in verse 20 and then in verse 27, you have an anointing from God. You have the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you and to, to, to teach you. And in, uh, in verse 27, he, he says, because of this anointing, you have no, one, no need for anyone to teach you. Now, what is he talking about here? Is John saying to the church, you don't have any need to be taught the Word of God? Well, it would actually be contrary to the very thing that he's doing in the letter, right? So we can uh, logically and spiritually conclude, well, that's not what he's talking about. And so what is he saying? What he is saying is this. He is saying that the Holy Spirit is ultimately the one who touches us and teaches us God's truth through a myriad of different ways and that we are not dependent upon man alone and especially one man or one woman who wants you to be totally devoted to them and their teaching and their movement. 
It's not dependent upon man or one man alone to teach us these things. Our anointing comes from the Holy Spirit, and all true Christians have this anointing. And today, thankfully, we also have the canon of Scripture, which they did not have back then, which we are told all Scripture is what? Let's say it out loud. Is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And so, here's the deal. The Holy Spirit is our greatest teacher, and the Word of God is our greatest textbook. Right? That's how it works. And the Holy Spirit does not limit Himself to man alone to teach us things regarding the kingdom of God. And He says, you guys know this. You know this, and this word know, it means to know intuitively. And we know it because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we see in verses 21 and, and in verse 26, we see another reason why John wrote this letter. He, he says, I write to you. It's always great when he tells us exactly what he wants us to know. And all throughout this scripture, or this uh, letter, about five times at least, he says, I'm writing to you for this reason. And so you don't have to guess. I write to you because you know the truth. And no lie is of the truth. Whoever denies Jesus is the Christ, denies both the Father and the Son, and they do not have the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit would never lead you to believe such an atrocious lie about God the Son. And so what does this mean about those who would want to teach us things that are not true, things that are a lie? Well, what they do, these false teachers, these false uh, prophets, is that they always, always, always diminish God the Son. They always do. And they do not believe that he is co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with God the Father. Guys, please hear this. Please get this in your heart and in your mind. All cults, without exception, all false teachers, all world religions diminish the person of Jesus Christ. And to diminish Jesus, Jesus is to fall under the spell of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. To deny this truth is Antichrist. Who is a liar? John asks. But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And so, please understand this. Christianity stands alone when it comes to Jesus. Christianity alone teaches the deity of Christ. If you do not believe in the deity of Christ, do not call yourself a Christian. Because we alone are the ones who hold to that belief and proclaim that belief. All of the world's religions diminish God the Son. He is always less than God. You see, if Jesus is not God, if He is less than God, if He is a created being, as some teach, that belief... That teaching, that declaration, both denies and defies the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And the incarnation is God becoming flesh, becoming man. Check out the scripture that's up on your screen right now, 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to read some of it. I'm going to ask you to read some of it with me. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. 
pastor of what was perhaps the, the largest church or one of the largest churches during the early church movement. And he says this to Timothy, and without controversy or literally without question. Okay, so we don't need to question this is what Paul's saying. Without question, great is the mystery of godliness. And I want you to read out loud with me the next six words. Let's begin. God was manifest in the flesh. Again, God was manifest in the flesh. One more time, three in one. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, that is to the nations, believed on in the world as God in the flesh and received up into glory. Hallelujah. Now, you may say, well, pastor, I don't believe that that's true because God cannot die. And that's a very valid question. That's a very valid comment. So uh, let me explain how it works. Because I don't want anyone to be confused with the mystery of godliness which is only found in Jesus Christ, the one, the God who is manifest in the flesh. You see, just like when we die, it is our body that dies, but our spirit lives on and will either go to heaven or go to hell. Those are the only two options. What died was Jesus' body, not his spirit, because the Holy Spirit is an eternal spirit, and Jesus is the everlasting God. And when he rose from the dead, he did so with what? A new transformed body, just like you and I will. But his spirit was never touched, it was never changed, it was never altered, and that's why it says that when Jesus died upon the cross, he cried out, these words, Father, into thy hands, let's say it out loud, I commit my spirit. His spirit never died because God cannot die, but his body died. His body was put to death. And it was beaten, and it was battered, and it was bloody, and it was agonizing, and he suffered a great death for you and for me. And so you're right, God cannot die, but his body died. You see, this earthly shell called the Son of Man that he clothed himself in, where he became like you and me, did indeed died, but rose from the dead. And that's why if you deny the Son that He is God, you deny the Father. If you defy the Son, you defy the Father. Why? Well, because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. <laughs> you call me a bad name, you're calling my Father a bad name because... We are co-equal. We're co-existent. We're co-eternal. And so, guys, please hear this. The denial that Jesus is God in the flesh is perhaps the greatest heresy the spirit of Antichrist has brought into the world. You see, it's more than a dark teaching. It is a dangerous and a demonic teaching because to embrace this doctrine is to deny both the Father and the Son. And I want you to notice what is at stake in verse 25. Take a look at that verse and just marinate on it for a second. What is at stake? eternal life. My eternal life and your eternal life and everybody in the world's 
eternal life hinges on this truth. I want you to look with me at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. This passage causes many people uh, problems. I, I won't name the ones that it really causes problems for. But, but this is what it says. And let's pay a close attention to words. Words are important, right? For in the case of those who have once been enlightened. And so these are people who have had their eyes open, right? They have been enlightened and have tasted, experienced. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? The gift of salvation. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. They are partners. They are partakers. They have experienced Him. And have tasted the good Word of God. They've been taught the truth. And the powers of the age to come, the power of God, His miraculous, supernatural power. And, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, which is the same thing as saying God the Son, and put Him to open shame. Guys, this is speaking of those who have been enlightened. Those are the Holy Spirit's words, not mine, who have tasted of the heavenly gift who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the Word, who, who, who have experienced the power of the supernatural, and then, after that, they have fallen away. And this, these words, fallen away, it's the only time in Scripture that they are used, and it speaks of those, listen, who have abandoned the faith. Not who have backslid or are struggling or, you know, having doubts and... No. It, it speaks of abandonment. It speaks of going AWOL intentionally, i.e. denied the faith. And that is within the context of what we're talking about with counterfeit Christians, right? They depart from the fellowship. They deny the faith. And we deny the faith, my friends, when we deny the one in whom our faith is based. The third thing that these counterfeit Christians do is that they deceive the family of God. They deceive the family of God. Verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. You do know that there are people in the church and outside the church that their only goal is to deceive you, right? So they're deceivers, they're seducers. And, and guys, we can get a lot of things wrong about the Bible. We all do. Well, you do. <laughs> Nobody has perfect theology. And, and if they think that, that's the time that they need to be discipled. Nobody has perfect theology but Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. We can get a lot of things wrong. We do get a lot of things wrong. All right. But here's the deal. You get this wrong. You get this one wrong. If you deny and thus defy the deity of Christ, there is no hope because you are putting your trust in a false Savior and a false God. He says they want to deceive you. 
And this word deceive, it carries with it the idea of being led astray. Its goal is that we might embrace a perverted and polluted faith. Its goal is that we would embrace error, thus rejecting truth. And that's what happens as we begin to wrap things up. That's what happens when we embrace erroneous teachings about Jesus. We end up rejecting the truth and in turn rejecting the true Jesus. You see, guys, just because you use the word Jesus doesn't mean anything. Just because you say you believe in Jesus doesn't mean that you believe in the real Jesus or the true Jesus. As I've said, all the cults and all the world religions acknowledge the person of Jesus, but it is a false Jesus that they embrace, and that's why the church is in the missions. It's so that they might worship the true God. And so the key is in verse 8, 28, excuse me. How, how do we keep from departing from the fellowship, denying the faith, deceiving the family of God because we're deceived ourselves? Verse 28 is the key. Abide in Jesus. And that's what this book, 1 John, is all about. Abiding with Him, fellowshipping with Him, and fellowshipping with one another. We'll talk about that more next week. Would you stand with me? And let's close together in this prayer. Let's pray this out loud. Jesus, you told us that you are the way, truth, and life. You also told us that you are the door and that no one could enter heaven but through you. Today we once again confess that you are Lord and that you are God in the flesh. We reject all lies and deceptions regarding your nature, your character, and your person. Teach us to know truth, love truth, live truth, and speak truth. In your name we pray, amen and amen. I'm going to ask the elders, the prayer team to come forward. And we're going to close in a song and in a time of prayer. We've gone over today, but I, I think it's a good going over. And the first thing that I just want to say to you is, is that if you do not know Jesus that we've been singing about, if you think that he was just a good guy or a good teacher or a good prophet, if you think that he was anything less than God himself, that, that is an error in your understanding and your belief. He is God, very God. And He alone came to save. And so, I want to encourage you today to place your faith in this God that loved you so much that He was willing to be tortured and beaten and battered and bloodied and suffer so that you and I might have relationship and fellowship with Him. He paid it all. And it's a free gift. I want to encourage you to come and to be prayed for. There might be some people here that, that want to make that step this morning. And if you have need of anything else, we want to pray for you. So come, whatever it is, we're here to pray with you and to stand with you. God bless you. face.
Give us wisdom and understanding. Show us what you have for us to do individually. And God, we just proclaim our love for you, and we thank you that you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen.